Uh, I believe that the U.S. experience with affirmative action has many ramifications and commonalities with affirmative action elsewhere. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, a, a, a great American scholar, uh, Thomas Sowell, uh, at Stanford, an econ a black economist, has written a, uh, a masterful survey of affirmative action in, across the world. Um, in uh, seven or eight countries, uh, United States, India, Malaysia, and uh, a, a number of others. And so uh, I think you will find, if you read that book, and it's very much worth reading if you're interested in affirmative action, that uh, the pattern I'm describing is uh, pretty much uh, universal. Though, of course, there are American aspects to it that uh, distinguish it. So the first, uh, I, I want to make uh, three general points. The first is, what the relationship of affirmative action is to multiculturalism, which of course is the uh, uh, very interesting and important theme of this conference. The ostensible purposes of affirmative action uh, uh, are obviously related to multiculturalism in the sense that uh, affirmative action is designed to recognize, to give uh, respect, uh, 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 ostensible respect, and to uh, protect the interests of minority groups for whom the majoritarian systems that operate around them uh, uh, will not necessarily uh, provide. I want to emphasize that there are other purposes of affirmative action which are less lofty uh, and which play an important role not only in its establishment initially, the way in which it's administered, but also its uh, uh, survival despite uh, uh, very serious criticisms over many, many years. So uh, remedial Reparative, corrective justice, uh, uh, those conceptions are uh, at the heart of the case for affirmative action, and uh, certainly no one who lives in the United States or even a ca has a casual uh, understanding of it could deny that uh, blacks in particular uh, have suffered grievously under, uh, under American um, conditions in America. Uh, those Conditions began to change rather radically in the 60s, but uh, they, still, uh, they still are a real s s blight on American life. Now, another important uh, uh, goal of uh, affirmative action is to assuage the feelings of guilt that assail all non-black Americans who think about it just even for a moment uh, about our shameful history and the way in which the um, the legacy of that history uh, continues to plague uh, American life. So that's the first, that's the first question and uh, uh, makes it a ripe topic of conversation for this particular uh, conference. Uh, a second point is that what I just alluded to, that the patterns that I'm about to describe uh, are true universally throughout the world whenever affirmative action programs have been established. They differ from time to time and place to place, that's true. Uh, each of is, is, t is presumably tailored to the conditions of the country that adopts it, uh, but the general patterns that I am about to describe uh, prevail. Um, so the third is to explore the nature of affirmative action, and I'll spend most of my time on, on that. It can take a variety of forms, and it operates in a variety of policy domains. So it uh, operates most prominently in the higher education realm, uh, but uh, it also applies to broadcasting licenses, uh, housing policies, and a whole raft of other uh, uh, policy areas. Um, the relationship of affirmative action to merit is uh, much disputed, uh, but I think in reality it's very clear that uh, it is a departure from merit. Now, merit can be defined in a variety of ways. Um, uh, in educational institutions uh, define merit, uh, again, very broadly uh, in terms of the attributes that the people who are competing for places in these uh, relatively prestigious institutions should possess, but um, they, uh, there, there's no question that on, on the, in terms of those characteristics, uh, they are uh, uh, there, uh, merit is not the uh, uh, criterion. There are deviations from merit in terms of preferences. Now, if you believe that merit uh, 
uh, consists of diversity. Uh, I'm going to spend a good deal of uh, my remaining time discussing what the relationship is between affirmative action and the so-called diversity justification for affirmative action on American uh, campuses. Second distinction uh, between merit and non-merit, uh, uh, having discussed not merit versus non-merit um, uh, understandings, is that uh, distinction between preferences and non-discrimination. Uh, this is a very important difference, especially in the American context. Americans believe strongly in equal opportunity, um, and uh, that's true even among con uh, uh, con professed conservatives. Indeed, conservatives uh, who are not extreme uh, will uh, emphasize equal opportunity uh, more, than, uh, more than others. But there's a big difference between uh, uh, preferences and non-discrimination uh, both normatively and practically. Uh, normatively, uh, as I said a moment ago, uh, Americans believe strongly that everybody should have a fair shake, that the, that the starting line should be as equal as one can uh, practically make it, um, and then the outcomes will reflect uh, a, variety of, uh, a variety of factors, hopefully not discrimination, um, because we have a variety of remedies for discrimination in the law that have been uh, uh, reinforced for uh, over 50 years. Uh, they're not perfect by any means, but they are uh, very strong uh, guarantees uh, of um, non-discrimination in our, in our laws and in our practices. Uh, everybody believes in equal opportunity in the United States, but uh, as far as preferences are concerned, uh, relatively few people do believe in them, and that includes minority groups uh, who uh, presumably are advantaged by these as well as uh, those in the ma majority. And as the discussion yesterday uh, uh, brought out, I think, very clearly, the notion of majority is itself a highly misleading uh, and even a pernicious uh, idea, uh, given the diversity of our societies and the ways in which majorities shift over time and uh, across uh, issue domains. Another important feature of affirmative action programs has to do with the size of the preferences, and they are preferences, as I've said before and as my article uh, uh, demonstrates. Uh, the size of the preference are, are immense. It's not just a thumb on the scales. It's not just a, well, all other things considered being equal uh, will favor uh, minorities. The, the preferences uh, uh, are very, very sizable. Uh, it's, this is described on page 330 of the article that you have access to with data uh, uh, from a number of, uh, of studies. There is also an important tendency to move from the idea of, of affirmative action uh, to quotas. And again, almost all Americans oppose quotas. Whenever the question is asked in terms of quotas, uh, there is a very, very high rejection including among minority groups, among the preferred uh, minority groups. This tendency to move toward quotas is not uh, embodied in the law, but is embodied in the way affirmative action programs operate, in the sense that a certain percentage of uh, seats in a university, uh, if that's the domain we're discussing, uh, are presumed to be uh, the right of minorities under affirmative action programs, and if those number of seats are not occupied by members of the, uh, 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 of the group, um, then uh, there's a presumption uh, which the institution has to overcome that it didn't do what it needed to do in order to attract enough uh, African Americans, if that's the group being preferred. I should also say that African Americans are not the only group that's preferred. Um, African Americans are the leading, uh, uh, present the most important um, ethical case for affirmative action, uh, but there's affirmative action for uh, many other groups, uh, including uh, uh, Asians, uh, Native Americans, women, and, uh, and sometimes uh, other groups as well. So when the numbers don't add up to what the authors or the sponsors of affirmative action believe they ought to add up to, uh, then there's a movement toward quotas. You've got to You've got to do more, and, uh, and we're going to measure your deficiency in terms of the difference between the numbers who we say should be there and the numbers who are actually uh, there. 
And the last aspect of affirmative action uh, in general uh, that I want to call attention to is its duration. Uh, it's often viewed as a temporary measure, at least those, that's the promise that's made by its sponsors. Uh, that turns out not to be the case. Uh, they've been in place for over 50 years in the United States. Uh, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor famously back in the 1990s uh, said that she hoped and believed that affirmative action would be not, would be un, come unnecessary in 20 years and the 20 years has, uh, I believe, elapsed or is about to elapse and they're still very much uh, in, in place. I, I want to give you some demographic figures that uh, speak to uh, the magnitude of the dispute over this. Blacks in the United States are 13 percent of the population. They're not proportionally represented in the most selective educational institutions. Harvard College, for example, uh, 7 percent of the students are black, um, uh, 17 percent are Asian, and uh, uh, 11 percent are hi Hispanic. In the case of Asians, they're only 6 percent of the population. They have 17 percent of the seats. Uh, that disparity is uh, uh, actually not even close to what their academic-based um, uh, admissions to Harvard College would generate if, 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 uh, the, if uh, there were no preferences except for those uh, uh, captured in academic uh, achievement. And that's the basis for a lawsuit against Harvard, which as many of you have uh, probably read about. It just began last week, uh, so the evidence is just coming out now, and it, I think it presents some very damaging, uh, uh, a, a very damaging picture of Harvard's practices uh, in this in this regard. Yale is the same. So some general points. Uh, first, even minorities oppose preferences and, and quotas. Uh, I've already mentioned the fact that uh, uh, the reasons given for uh, opposition to preferences, uh, which is shared by minority groups, as I just said. Uh, are uh, based on a, a sense of uh, fairness and justice, just as the arguments in favor of affirmative action uh, are based on those sorts of claims. Um, there's a widespread conviction in the United States uh, that affirmative action has been abused, and uh, the, the ultra-conservative forces in the United States have made uh, very uh, good use of this, uh, particularly President Trump, who has uh, tried to mock uh, the uh, uh, credentials of uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren, a, 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 a great and popular liberal in the United States, for her claims to have had Native American heritage, which turned out after a DNA test, which for some reason she uh, had d done recently, uh, showed that she had, uh, her, her Cherokee blood went back uh, uh, to uh, a very long time ago at a very small percentage of her blood. Now, there's a difference between the constitutional uh, 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 critique of uh, affirmative action and a policy-based critique of affirmative action. In my view, affirmative action programs are, in general, constitutional. I don't share the view of many uh, that, uh, that it's unconstitutional just because it might seem to be a violation of the equal protection of the laws and that it favors some groups uh, some um, ethnic groups uh, over others. I believe it's a bad policy, not that it's unconstitutional. That because the framers of the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause themselves enacted affirmative action programs at the time of, uh, at the end of the Civil War in conjunction, conjunction with what were called the Freedmen's Acts, which gave special consideration to uh, blacks who had just been uh, uh, just been uh, freed and would soon become uh, citizens. A very small percentage of the blacks who uh, receive affirmative action uh, preferences in the United States and universities are actually descendants of black slaves in the United States. Um, an estimated 75 percent of a affirmative action eligible uh, people are um, immigrants with green cards, which is hard to get, so they're already sort of a privileged uh, segment of the uh, immigrant uh, population. Um, at, at Harvard, uh, up to two-thirds of the blacks there are immigrants from West Indies and from Africa. Uh, only one-third of Harvard's black students had four U.S.-born grandparents. So you see the, the distinction uh, between the claims of affirmative action in that respect and the, and, and the reality.
just a, a few more points. Um, I won't go through the uh, legal uh, status of affirmative action. I do that in the chapter, uh, which you can read if, if you like. Um, but uh, the key point that I want to mention now is that uh, the court uh, upheld affirmative action in that case only on the basis of certain fairly narrow claims, and they were all based on the so-called diversity jurisdiction. That is to say that the favored groups would add diversity, would add different viewpoints, different perspectives to the student body, and that's a valid uh, educational objective. Uh, much of my chapter uh, speaks to that diversity justification, and it's entirely, in my view, I think I, I think I demonstrate this effectively. In my view, it's question begging and it's uh, unconvincing. Uh, first of all, the meaning of diversity it look is is a very narrow one. It looks only at skin color uh, and uh, and ethnicity. It doesn't look to viewpoint. It doesn't look to uh, the way in which uh, one might uh, take uh, uh, share one's background uh, is with other students who uh, lack that background. A key concept in the, in the uh, legal justification and, and uh, authorization of affirmative action in the Fisher case, which is the most recent uh, decision by the Supreme Court, is that uh, affirmative action is designed to produce a critical mass, critical mass of, uh, of uh, minority students in the, uh, in the student body. Uh, what does critical mass mean? That's completely ill-defined. And if you think about it just for a moment, you'll see that uh, critical mass could apply to the membership of the student body as a whole. It could apply to particular colleges within the university. It could apply to particular majors. It could apply, apply to the composition of seminars, uh, which is, after all, what most of the, where most of the interaction that affirmative action uh, 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 thinks will occur is, is supposed to take place. Stereotypes under our affirmative action programs have been reinforced. They have increased the stigma attached with uh, uh, being an, an, a, a, a beneficiary of affirmative action. Part of the problem is that you can't tell when you're looking at a person uh, who is, uh, uh, let's say, an African-American person on campus, whether he or she was a beneficiary of affirmative action or not. But if it's known that that person was a beneficiary of affirmative action, then there really is, in a highly competitive environment, a stigma that attaches to that person, even if he or she does not deserve that stigma because he or she would have been admitted in any event. Uh, there's just no way of, uh, no way of, of knowing. Uh, the size of the plus factor, as I said a moment ago, is not modest, it is enormous. Uh, and that increases the resentment uh, uh, of, uh, of others uh, about the, uh, the, the system. Um, the court required the, that uh, the university or uh, other uh, body that is uh, putting affirmative action in place uh, consider race-neutral alternatives. There are race-neutral alternatives. I don't think uh, the states have pursued these to the, nearly to the extent that they uh, should in, in order to justify their affirmative action program by saying that those alternatives didn't uh, suffice. Um, and um, uh, let me just mention a couple of those alternatives very, very quickly. First is to base uh, preferences on socioeconomic criteria rather than racial or ethnic uh, criteria. Uh, that wouldn't be as well targeted on minorities as, uh, as, a, as the current uh, programs, but there would be a, a, a considerable uh, um, uh, augmentation of the number of other disadvantaged people who don't happen to have the skin color or the surname, in the case of Hispanics, uh, that, um, that the beneficiaries uh, uh, receive. Uh, secondly, um, there is a preference for legacies and athletes at, uh, at these schools, and they can start, constitute a, uh, not huge, but a significant number of places in the university, which uh, I think ought to be filled uh, on the basis of other criteria. Uh, some people will differ, especially those who run universities and who are, look to alumni uh, uh, and uh, 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 revenue from uh, football games uh, to um, 
to do their jobs. But uh, that's one area where there is obvious uh, discrimination uh, uh, that uh, it seems to be blinked at. Uh, a third is to increase civil rights enforcement uh, through our equal opportunity uh, programs. Uh, that is, uh, that would be uh, very uh, welcome and uh, I think entirely uh, supported by, um, uh, by many of those who support affirmative action. Uh, and fin finally, there are anti-poverty policies. I believe, and I have a discussion in another chapter in this book, that uh, poverty is at the root of this problem. Uh, and um, there are a variety of ways in which poverty in the United States could be, uh, could be addressed. They're all inadequate to completely solve the problem. I acknowledge that, uh, but um, uh, they, they, ought to be, uh, they ought to be instituted. Um, the, last, the last word I'll say is that recent developments uh, uh, that you may or may not know about is that uh, uh, President Trump in July of this year revoked seven Obama-era requirements for affirmative action in education. Um, and I think he was right to do that, although I'm bitterly opposed to Trump. And so it seems to me it's an example of the principle that even a broken clock is right twice a day. Um, and I have no doubt that his, uh, that there is, a, a, he has a racist uh, agenda or is appealing to a racist uh, segment of the population. So his motives are uh, not, the, um, not the end of the argument, it seems to me. Um, the, I told you about the uh, action that's been brought by Asian uh, students uh, against Harvard. Um, uh, the focus has been on personal ratings, so-called personal ratings, uh, which gives the admissions officers unquantified discretionary uh, uh, ability to uh, uh, to make choices that disadvantage Asians, and they seem to have used it in that respect, even though the percentage of Asians at Harvard, 17%, is, uh, is much higher than the percentage in the population, which is uh, generally, which is uh, about uh, 6%. So uh, the last point I'll make uh, is that uh, uh, there are important political uh, actors and interests that are in favor of affirmative action. Uh, which, uh, which really uh, might surprise you. Um, the Democratic Party, maybe not so surprising. Large corporations, uh, the military, uh, leading colleges and universities, and elite commentators. Uh, they are among those in, uh, affirmative action uh, for a variety of reasons that I think are, are, are misguided, in some case uh, political or, or, or an effort to avoid uh, discontent uh, among um, among the populations that are uh, less represented um, and to curry favor with, uh, with, uh, with groups. So the politics of affirmative action is, uh, is, is very uh, complicated. And uh, I just want to suggest that affirmative action, although it doesn't affect that many people, um, uh, it was a factor, I think, in the rise of Trumpism uh, because of the reaction of uh, many Americans and, not, and not racists, but other Americans as well, who, uh, who see in this a very uh, unjust and non-warranted uh, uh, non and, and unsuccessful uh, policy. So uh, it's easy to caricature affirmative action, given the political lineup that I mentioned a moment ago, as, a, as uh, favoring elites, uh, as denying equal opportunity to whites, especially working class uh, whites. Um, and I believe in, at the end, the Democrats would be very wise on a number of grounds, not just political grounds, but on the merits uh, to reconsider uh, their fervent support for affirmative action. Thank you. I kindly ask your understanding that we would allow one question, please, from the audience. Professor, uh, I understand that essentially your talk is about allocating scarce resources. In particular, you were talking about scarce resources of admissions into uh, prestigious universities. Previously, those resources were allocated through financial uh, access. If you had money, you could get in. If you didn't have money, you didn't get in. I understand that. 
Could you explain what you mean by being admitted on merit? And to me, this is a very amorphous uh, description of uh, reasons to admit people to college. So what do, what do you mean by merit, uh, merit admission? A couple of things preliminarily. First of all, it's not the case that financial uh, 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 resources are still uh, the decisive factor. It's not, it's simply not true. Uh, elite institutions have been very, very uh, active in designing uh, financial aid programs that are very, very generous. Uh, indeed, at, at the top schools, the, uh, the notion is that no student should not be able to attend these schools for reasons of, uh, of financial uh, conditions. So uh, that's, simply, that's simply not true. It was certainly true many, many years ago, but it, but it isn't, hasn't been true for a long time. Uh, secondly, as I said, the idea of merit is, uh, is uh, one that uh, does not lend itself to a crisp def definition. I think it's up to each institution to define what it cons constitutes merit. And I think that uh, on the general criteria that these institutions themselves seems to emphasize, which is academic performance and promise, uh, which correlates highly with uh, uh, success uh, later on in life, um, uh, though that would constitute the, the definition of merit that they implicitly and sometimes explicitly endorse. Now, uh, as I say, the diversity juris justification has also been added to that by uh, many institutions who practice affirmative action. And as I've tried to show, and I show in great detail in the, in the chapter, uh, that's a bit of a fraud. Um, it's a fraud in part because of, as I said, the statistics show that the uh, people who are favored from the protected groups are not themselves uh, the descendants of, of uh, American slaves. Uh, they are generally quite privileged uh, by reason of their uh, uh, immigration to the United States from places where uh, they have been relatively privileged, such as the, uh, uh, such as the Caribbean. Um, so uh, there's a lot more to be uh, a lot more to be said about this, uh, uh, but um, uh, the vast difference in the academic achievements between the favored group and the uh, the uh, rest of the uh, uh, academic population at those institutions uh, suggests it's a lot more than uh, some definition of merit that is driving this program.